Welcome back, I'm Richard D. Hall and I'm talking to Jim Kelly who was placed in a maximum security psychiatric uh, prison yeah. and uh, f between 1997 and 2006 for nine and a half years for no good reason. Yeah. Um, he wasn't uh, charged or arrested for anything and basically there was this phantom crime that, he, that his name was attached to that they used to keep him in there and he believes he was set up as some kind of uh, patsy possibly some IRA patsy, which we've explained in the other yep. two sections. Now, before the break, we mentioned that you wrote to all of these MPs and um, you got replies from 45% of them. And you think it, at least it raised some awareness to politicians and, and possibly, you know, that, that, that's maybe doing some good, even if they're not doing anything directly about it. Yeah, because it, 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 and more or less, I think it put the, the cats amongst the pigeons bear. Mm -hmm. Certain elements within the House of Commons were, go, were finding about something that only a select few would have, uh, would have known about. Mm -hmm. So I know that I had to look at the, the Sunday Times uh, and it said in it that the, the House of Commons had sat in private and they did not know, but they had, it was an emergency, they sat in private, and it was only, set, I think, the second time in the history that they'd actually uh, done that. All right, so, um, but you were in touch, or you, you'd made contact with a, a journalist, a News of the World journalist, yeah. who became aware of your predicament. Yeah. Now, just tell us about that. This is David Leslie, a yeah. News of the World journalist. Uh, this, this fellow Glaswegian, uh, he says he, that's the best people to go to, the, the press to catch the area, but I had to do it a certain way. He said it's better to go to the press rather than the politics. Yeah, that's what he said, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. The, the, the worst of two evils, or the, or the best of two evils, whatever, but go on. Yeah, but, but it turned out, no, I mean, the, the way I was looking at it was it's another avenue here, no, if I could get them, mm -hmm. uh, get, yeah. get the press involved, to get them on board, mm -hmm. uh, but then just give them a wee bit so they would bite it up without gaining the whole story because I knew they would right. drop it like a ton of bricks. So, so they didn't cover it while you were in, still inside, but when you got out, the News of the World actually wrote an article about Jim, and we can show that on the screen, uh, but they didn't, initially didn't want to, did he? Just tell us what he, what he said in his letter to you. Yeah, they, they, he said that they, um, they had been threatened, the director had been direct, uh, from the News of the World, uh, they had been threatened by the spooks, and that was his words, uh, that to drop me, so right. the director of the News of the World, he said, was threatened by the spooks yep. to drop your story. To drop the story, right. to drop me, because, th and they, they knew right away that saying, if I'm writing to David Leslie covertly to a supposed female mm -hmm. uh, in the west coast of Scotland, uh, they knew the alarm bell started ringing, that this, there was something really in this. Right. Do you know what I mean? It was like, it, what it okay. done was it put petrol on the fire. Right. As to say, so it was giving it more credit. When they came, became involved, it gave me more credibility. Right. And I think the newspaper became hungry, but they were being careful. Right. So, but when they did cover the article, what they did, uh, they, because as we said, um, Jim, Jim wrote all of these hundreds of MPs, and he had replies from 45% of them, he said. One of them was John Major there, John Major. One of them was um, Margaret Beckett, uh, who was in the Labour government at the time. Or the cabinet, yeah. And um, but in the article, I think th they chose to feature a picture of Jerry Adams. Yeah, who happened to be one of the forty-five percent who replied. Who, who replied? Jerry Adams replied to the to the letter yeah. that you sent. So, so in other words, it's basically kind of tarring you with the yeah. Shane it, it, Fein it, it, yeah, it, it potential was, ooh, IRA uh, it, link. It was done like I had gave the news of all all the letters. Who the, the MPs who kindly, who mm -hmm. kindly, I can't thank them enough. The people mm -hmm. who, who had the bottle, the, the MPs who had the bottle to say, I'll acknowledge that guy. Although mm -hmm. I can't help him, they acknowledge it and he did help me, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that gives me still a wee bit of faith, you know what I mean? And some of them, I'm not mm -hmm. saying they're all bad. A wee bit of faith. Just a, a wee, wee bit, bit of faith. faith. <laughs> but it did, say, it did go a long way, Richard, yeah. no? Yeah. It, I'd, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, th so really, in a way, that story was handled. Oh, I think like. it was it was hijacked. Yeah, or hijacked. In yeah. uh, my five, I think hijacked it and right. manipulated them round to working it. Because see, after that, they dropped me like a ton right. of bricks. But you never ever raised with the with the news of the world and David Leslie the fact that you thought that your setting up, you being set up as an IRA guy, right, mm -hmm. was a diversion for the Diana murder. No, that's and they just played that. That I mean, they came. You know, but, but did you say that you were being that you thought you'd been set up as a as a, an IRA patsy? 
No, no, no. You never mentioned no, that no, at all. No, no, Just no. that you'd been put in a mental institution yeah. for no apparent reason, yeah. and some firearms incident at yeah. Glasgow Station had been you'd been blamed. They they ran the story, right. and and they ran the ran the story. I spent nine and a half years. Why was I incarcerated? That's Why the way they've done it. They yeah. did not. They didn't want to know. But they didn't they, want to know that. But what they'd done was they were subtle and putting Jerry Adams in that uh, frame as if to say, right. that's why he was yeah. in there. People might be sitting at home thinking, well, why would they do that? And, and you think the reason is that, that when, they, when they're carrying out an, an operation which is as, as important as getting rid of someone like Diana, it's a major, major operation. So they, they, they're going to want to have an excuse. They're going to want to, they're going to, want to be able to say, no, no, we were in Scotland yeah. chasing these two IRA guys, yeah. and we've, we've actually got one of yeah. them who's in a mental institution. This is where our operations were, yeah. in, in Glasgow, in, uh, on the 31st of August, the, 1997, yeah. which was the day that they were following you and then uh, subsequently charged, well, they didn't charge you, they um, yeah. blamed you for something which didn't happen. It was a lynch, linchpin in the sense that they could turn around and say, that man's in there, but he's either, he's in there, he's alive, or he could be dead like the other one. Mm -hmm. Do you know, so it's the, the lesser of two evils, which are the way they look at it and saying, well, he's in a safe haven, mm -hmm. it may be the most comfortable environment, but he's alive. Yeah. You no, know, that, that's probably the way they look at it. So how did you manage to get out? Yeah, I think with the, the, the publicity to the MPs, the news of the world, mm -hmm. uh, things were starting to really go my way, right. do you know? Okay. No, I think, yeah. And, and, and possibly the, the delegation. The, maybe the European Court of yeah. Human Rights, it all added together. You think that was maybe just putting a little bit of pressure to say... Oh, well, I, I, I think it's one of the ones, Richard, when you, if things start to mushing out, people start asking questions, yeah. then you can't have that there. I could have spent the rest of my life in there. Yeah. I really could have, no, and right. I, I do believe, no, I mean, I did get myself out there. Right. But it's purely just be re-educate myself. Uh, so, so just to go back to your friend, a lot of people who've listened to this whole story will be thinking, well, what role was your young friend taking in all this? A guy in his mid twenties who had connections with Dublin. He often went over there, and he was in the farming community in, in the outskirts of Glasgow. Yeah. He said he had a milk round. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so how do you think? Have you got any thought as to as to when and how he's become involved because clearly he was the, the, what got you involved with yep. this car. Uh, You've uh, got uh, no uh, inkling as to... I've often thought if he was an agent, uh -huh. um, I wasn't a double agent, but a, yeah. very, a very good agent, but a naive uh, agent yeah. uh, who was bumped. Right. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and maybe he was encouraged to get you to hire that car, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, in the London, in the in the London bombings, they were they were in a higher car. Yeah, similar thing. So that's what I'm saying, and it happened to be like um, Christopher McGorry was a, a good communicator, mm -hmm. do you know, and uh, right, it, it was nobody's fool. For like, such a young man, you know, I mean, he had a wealth right. of experience. You no, know, I mean, he could turn his hand to a lot of things, and uh, when when you actually find people who are linked to mm -hmm. intelligence agencies and are assets either witting or unwitting, mm -hmm. they're the most unlikely characters sometimes, you know, yeah. that, that they use. Yeah. So, for good reason, that they're unlikely. It, uh, it, it's a very, um, it's a strange situation, do you know, how it's like, uh, how he phoned me up and told me about the car, and mm -hmm. it was he told to phone me up, do you know right. what I mean, and report yeah. that, and, and yeah. set the wheels in motion. Mm -hmm. to come now, there. something that we haven't discussed is that when you were in there, after you'd been in about three weeks, Mm -hmm. you felt that you were subjected to some kind of mind control. Yeah. Uh, now, we've discussed this, and, and you, I, I have asked you, you know, what, was it not just a headache or something like no, that? No, 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 definitely So, so you're, in this, you're in this secure ward mm -hmm. on your own, isolated, 3 o'clock in the morning, so just tell us what happens. Yeah, I'd, uh, I was sleeping. It was kind of, there was a sort of red light in the cell, a small red, uh, red night light, and I was woken up with this, Terrible, terrible, high-pitched frequency squealing in my brain. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, you know how the Boomtown Rat song goes? I don't like Mondays. Oh, yeah, yeah. The silicon chip inside his head gets switched to overload. Mm -hmm. Well, that reminds me in that sense. No, it's such a strange, mm -hmm. um, strange song, some lyrics in that song, but this was like something was put overload in my brain, mm -hmm. and uh, the pain was so intense. 
my throat started to go into spasms and uh, like a choke. So you think you were being acted on by Almost some kind of weapon? Yeah, yeah, oh, definitely. I didn't realise, you know, I mean, I, I didn't know anything about microwave weapons, you know, and the actual mind control and the, the direct uh, energy weapons. I didn't know anything about that until I was released and started looking at it at the internet. To me, it was such a bizarre situation. I was alone behind a locked door in a psychiatric unit where nobody could hear my screams. It was such a frightening experience, Richard. I mean, I found myself in the space of maybe 60 seconds being woke up, running, grabbing the belt, looping the belt, tying so a knot the in belt the belt. you pulled out your jeans? Yeah. Hooking it over a, a wardrobe door, the corner of the wardrobe door, put my neck in through it, and like seconds away from death. Right. That's how serious. Do you know what I mean? And it's like. So you felt that you were being steered to do this. Yeah. By yeah. this weapon. Yeah. And it right. was like uh, it was so intense. I defecated. I shot myself, and I don't right. like saying that. This is how bad this was, you know what I mean? It wasn't imagined. I've always been a fighter and I will never commit suicide. I'll say that and I'll state that on this TV. I will never commit suicide. Yeah. I've never attempted I value my life, you know what I mean? And I'm a fighter, yeah. do you know? But it, they showed me they had the ultimate weapon, an ultimate weapon that nobody is safe from, right. do you know? And it, st it stood with me, but it also sent me a message as if to say, if we wanted you gone, you would have been gone, but you right. are there serving a purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, and I knew then that I was going to be there a so, long so time. So you think that they needed you alive in order to say, yeah, we've actually got one of these yeah. guys, yeah. sort of thing? I think it, uh, it more or less lent, lent, it gave more weight to uh, the reason uh, for being in there. Mm. It was such a, such a frightening, and I'll never forget it, Richard, because it's not a type of thing that, I mean, anybody would say could possibly happen. Mm. You could write a book on, on, on this information. This is just what is, what Jim is noted down briefly, he's filled this yeah. entire notepad on his story, so we haven't got all the detail in today's yeah. interview, but uh, th th that's what's happened to you and it's out now. Yeah, I, I, and I really appreciate it, Richard, because uh, I, I didn't have any sort of what you call with an insurance policy, you know, and uh, it's one of the ones where uh, uh, there's people in the truth movement like yourself, who I admire, and a lot of other people admire, because you talk the talk. No, there's no everybody, everybody likes to talk, but you will practice what you preach mm. and put it down, you know what I mean, you're one of the brave ones. And it's like, uh, you have gave me the confidence to mm. come and, and speak about mm. this and give me the opportunity, and I can't thank you enough. Okay. I, really, I really can't, because uh, uh, this will give me a lot more confidence to go on. And, and you've rebuilt your life a bit, Jim, have you? Yeah, yeah, I, I've, I've started to build my, my life again. I've got, uh, I've got a new partner. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, obviously, the, over the past year, I, I, I plan to talk to Edge Media, mm -hmm. uh, and I spoke with Ian R. Crane uh, mm -hmm. in Edinburgh. Uh, but when I done that, um, things started to really get crazy again. No? Right. So you okay. think communicating with the alternative media possibly? Yeah. Was you were being watched or? No, well, my flat had um, been burgled. Uh, my computer had been stolen. Uh, so, so just a just a. Backtrack before we finish, Jim, and touch on the... You, you think the British Transport Police are kind of yeah. used as a branch of intelligence services oh, to, yeah. to set up patsies and yeah. manage them and what have you, and they've got a few yeah. bad apples in there. It's, a, it's an important one, Richard. I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, it's like the 7-7 incident. It's like yeah. it happened in the subway, and the first people to respond there would be the British Transport right. Police with the terrorist division. You're not saying that every British... Transport police officer is. is no, you, you, they, you think that there's a, a group of them within there yeah, <coughs> oh, that I, have got a connection to yeah, well, their, their dirty tricks, basically. Their, their headquarters is in um, uh, Tavistock Square, right. where one of the, the, the bus blew up. Uh -huh. uh, you had the subways as well where the, they, they came under their auspices. But I think that um, British Transport Police uh, prevent any blowback, what you would call blowback, mm -hmm. to the police organisation, whether it be the Metropolitan Police or whether it be Strathclyde Police, they are first force and they're a small, okay. a, a small unit. So let's just name this guy again, he's a Detective Inspector Rogers who was with uh, British Transport Police in British, Glasgow. British Transport Police in Glasgow in 1997 and he basically uh, made up a crime that, yeah. was, that got you put in a mental institution for nine and a half years. Yeah. And uh, if anyone knows who that is, please let us know because uh, 
uh, really, uh, it, it's a heinous crime. He's possibly been taking orders from yeah. from elsewhere, but it's it still needs to be uh, counted and brought to justice. Yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable what can happen in Great Britain, our country. You would look at it and say this is the sort of thing that would happen in Russia. Mm. Do you know something like the KGB would do? We live in a democracy. Yeah. We don't put people in mental institutions. We don't kill people going to their work. Yeah. yeah. We're starting to learn, Richard. Yeah. All right then, Jim. Well, thanks a lot for coming down from Glasgow to Hi. to talk about your life and you know all the best for the future. Uh, um, do you see your kids now, Jim? Well, my kids is uh, they're all grown up now. Well, my boys. Do you, do you see them? No, I don't see them. No. No, uh, it's like the, when the bond right. was broken, they were only small. Right, yeah, okay. All right, and Jim, well, I will let you know any feedback that I get from this interview, of course, but uh, once again, thanks very much. Thanks, Richard, I really appreciate it. It just remains for me to say, I believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. I'm Richard D. Hall. Good night. <laughs>